a veteran, someone who has served in the military, has sacrificed time, has sacrificed family, has sacrificed themselves. Those who have fallen have truly sacrificed everything they are. Veterans Day, if you read in the bulletin, it's a little bit different from Memorial Day. Memorial Day, we remember those who have fallen. Veterans Day, we remember all, both the living and those who have given their lives or who have passed away. In fact, veteran, that comes from a Latin word meaning vetus, means old, old. Have you ever seen um, Veterans Day parades? When I was young, I remember Veterans Day parades when you'd have, at that time, I think we still had World War I vets alive, but they'd be really, really old. And I'm a little kid, and they'd be, they'd be marching in the Veterans Day parade, and they'd be all white-haired and some in wheelchairs, and I'm thinking, you know, I didn't connect the fact that they were 18 and 20 when they were in the, vet, when they were in the war, and I'm thinking, how did they ever do anything? Man, they're so old. How could they even pick up a rifle? I could never figure that out. We still have a few veterans left from World War II. Um, every year, they're getting less and less. I know, I think the last Tuskegee Airmen passed away this past year, 2019. Um, you know, that was the all black um, squadron of fighters, fighter pilots. And they had uh, red, red tails, painted red on their planes. And apparently what I read and hear is that they were so good because they felt they had something to prove. So they overtrained. They were so disciplined that whenever the bomber crews were on their way into Ger Nazi Germany, they would request the Red Tails to be their fighter squadron of protection because they were so good. And I think the last one, or maybe next to last one, just passed away. And every year we have veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans, passing away. So when you, you see them, they were outside yesterday of Sam's Club collecting. Uh, many times we have veteran groups collecting, the VFW, for example, collecting. Um, and so when you have that opportunity to give, to help, help out, give, give something to help them, uh, because they're, 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 it's a good group, um, and they, they need all the help and all the support. I grew up in the 60s, not the 1860s, but the 60s, <laughs> contrary to popular belief. Um, and I was anti-war. I swallowed that hook, line, and sinker. And, um, but I was appalled when some of the guys came back and they'd be arriving at airports and people would spit on them. And that, that caused me to begin to rethink my stance on our military. And uh, then I, I moved to Israel after college. And that, that changed me forever. And I realized what a sacrifice these men and women were making and how important it is. And for, since then, I mean, interestingly, living in a foreign country made me patriotic. Living in a foreign country and seeing other countries made me realize that America is great and shall be great and shall be greater. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And I think every American should want America to be great. And that should not be a, anything, whether it's attached to a particular candidate or person, get over it. We stand for our nation. Those veterans, they were not just fighting for a president or a Congress. They were fighting for our nation. And we are one nation under God. United, we stand. So let's drop these petty differences. And let's stand to make America great and remain great. Amen? All right. Um, can somebody take the soapbox away for me? I'm done. I wasn't planning on saying any of that, but it just came. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now, to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor yet that he should offer himself over and over as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood. For then must he often suffer since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And this is chapter 9, Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, verse 23. 
And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, some Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I want to just briefly talk about sacrifice. The first sacrifice was, of course, the sacrifice of the animals to clothe Adam and Eve after they sinned. Before there was sin, there was no need of sacrifice. But after sin, a sacrifice was made. Now, we don't have a formal sacrifice being written about in the book of Genesis with an altar and the animals, but the animals were killed, their blood was shed, their skin were covering Adam and Eve. So from that moment on, blood became the covering for sin. Blood would cover. Blood would not remove. Blood would cover. Every type of animal was offered in every culture on the face of the earth. Things were offered as sacrifice to gods or to God. Every, everyone, you cannot find a culture that did not offer blood, that did not sacrifice. Um, it, it, it devolved into appeasing the God, not covering sin, but a trying to bribe gods and goddesses by offering. Uh, humans were offered a sacrifice. Children were offered a sacrifice. Uh, some of the Canaanite cultures uh, offered child sacrifice. We know that even into the Roman time period, there were sacrifices of children by the... Uh, uh, can't remember their name. They lived in North Africa. They were the major threat to Rome. In, uh, the Carthaginians, thank you. The Carthaginians, who were descendants of Canaanites. They came from Phoenicia. The Phoenicians were Canaanites. And um, then in the, in, in the high, 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 high period, not classical Greece, but pre-classical Greece, the Bronze Age, when you have the Mycenaean civilization, this mighty, mighty civilization, worldwide civilization. I mean, worldwide, the known world at the time, they had trade agreements and all kinds of things going on. They offered sacrifice of men and women. So what we're looking at is the need for sacrifice. People have this inner need for sacrifice to atone, to cover. Noah, after the flood, first thing he did is sacrifice. Now, this is where we're going to start looking at some things that'll, that uh, really have to do with us. Noah, as soon as the flood was over, sacrificed. Before the flood, two by two, he took two of every kind of animal, right? Except clean animals. He took seven of those. He prepared to sacrifice. I think a lot of people are not prepared to sacrifice anything today. This is the problem. When we talk about the world seeping into the church, we can talk about it in a lot of different ways, but this is one way that I think the world has effectively seeped into the church. No one is prepared to sacrifice. As soon as the church is called upon to sacrifice, people head for the door. People cut out. People find another place to go where nothing is asked of them, nothing is required of them. Am I right? I mean, it's, all, it's real quiet in here. Is everybody going to get up and leave all of a sudden? I'm not asking anything just yet. Just yet. But sacrifice. Right? When, when, a, set, when a, a, a call is put out to sacrifice, to go beyond what you normally do and sacrifice time, sacrifice money, sacrifice in prayer, sacrifice in fasting, sacrifice in soul winning. You know, when um, it doesn't matter, we've pastored churches over a thousand and churches of a few hundred but it's always about 12 people that come out for soul winning when we have soul winning activities when we go knocking on doors it's always about the same number it doesn't matter if you have a thousand people in the church you don't get a hundred people coming out it's always about 12 15 people that come out for soul winning people that are motivated to give a few hours of their time motivated to sacrifice a morning to serve God our entire understanding of our faith should be based on sacrifice because we're here because of someone else's sacrifice. Well, we're talking about Veterans Day. We are free because of someone's sacrifice. The signers of the Declaration, Declaration of Independence sacrificed their, how did they put it at the end? Their lives, their honor, their sacred honor, and there's something else. Fortunes, thank you. 
because when they put that name on the paper, they were traitors and could be hung. When the British went to Lexington and Concord, most people don't understand. Why did they go to Lexington and Concord? They're going to Concord because the Patriots had a storehouse of ammunition there. They're going to Lexington because John Adams and um, John Hancock were staying there. And the British wanted to arrest them. They were wanted criminals. They sacrificed. And then, war after war, people sacrificed, men and women. Not just men, but women. You know, um, about eight years ago, no, more than that, I'm sorry, about 15 years ago, um, we were con my family was contacted by another family in the Midwest, and they told us a chapter of my dad's life that I knew nothing, my mom knew about it, I knew nothing about it. My dad was going to marry somebody else before he married my mom. She was serving in the, in the USO, but not for the shows that would come. She was going to the front lines with donuts and coffee. And while there are bullets and bombs not very far away, the troops that were being rotated back were getting hot coffee and donuts and sandwiches. And these ladies were serving. And my dad, in France, he was in the Normandy invasion, and in France he fell in love with this young lady. And they, and according to her diaries, they would see each other every time they could. They were going out to dinners and things when, they, when he was on leave and uh, she was stationed there, he was stationed there. And he proposed to her. And she, she put him off, not because she didn't love him. Apparently from her letters to her family, she loved him. But it was too unstable with a wartime situation. And sure enough, a month later, she was flying to Paris and got shot down and killed. She wasn't flying on business. She was flying to visit Paris. She'd never have seen Paris. And she, had, she took a military hop to Paris to visit it. But on the way, she was shot down. So there are women, as well as men, who have given their lives. We can criticize our government, whether you want to criticize the Democrats or criticize the Republicans or conservatives or liberals. We can do that because people laid their lives down. You couldn't do that in Nazi Germany. And if Nazi Germany had taken over here, or if the communists had taken over here from China, or any of those, those countries that repress their people, whether socialist or communist or Nazi, which is National Socialist Democratic Party, I think was the name of that, no matter who, we would not be able to criticize the government freely. We would not have the freedoms we have. But because brave young people, brave young people, thought that they could lay their lives down for a greater cause, the cause of freedom, the cause of nation. Abraham, when he arrived in the land of promise, sacrificed. We're not talking about a son. We're talking about sacrifice. Because he sacrificed because of the fulfillment of a promise. So we have Noah who sacrificed, but he was prepared. He prepared to sacrifice. Abraham sacrificed because there was a fulfillment of a promise. When we get a blessing, when we have an answered prayer, do we sacrifice something to God to thank him? Now, you know, we don't need blood sacrifice. That's been done. We'll get to that. But do we do something out of sacrifice of thanksgiving? Because the scripture clearly tells us we should have a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Yeah. What do we do to sacrifice in thanksgiving to the Lord because of a fulfillment of a promise, a fulfillment of a blessing? Abraham built an altar and sacrificed when he got to the land fulfillment of the promise of God. Then later on he was called to sacrifice his son. It was not uncommon at that time. I, I said that a few moments ago so you understand this was not some strange demand. Of course not for Jewish people, him being the first of the line of Israel, but other cultures all around were sacrificing children. This child, however, was the promise, the promise. He was willing to sacrifice the promise, not sacrifice in thanksgiving for the promise, but sacrifice the promise. Are you willing to forego the promise for somebody else to be blessed? 
Are you willing to sacrifice a promise in order to bless someone else? And that sacrifice was costly. His son. He was willing, no matter what the cost. Are you willing to sacrifice no matter what the personal cost? It's real quiet. I'm sorry. I'm getting the feeling that people don't like what they're hearing. We're blessed. The tabernacle was built in the wilderness as a place of sacrifice. And I want you to picture this. The entire tabernacle is constructed around sacrifice. That's what it's for. It's for sacrifice. And interestingly, where there was sacrifice, that's where the presence of God manifested. Where there is sacrifice, the presence of God is manifested. The tabernacle divided the outside from the inside. Divided the world from the spirit and in the enclosure went all the activities of sacrifice and the presence of God in the pillar of fire and pillar of smoke was there and he spoke his voice came from there the place of sacrifice then it was formalized in the temple and the temple was built in Jerusalem but interestingly the temple was built in the highest place of the city where everyone could see it you know in Washington DC no building is allowed to be built higher than 14 stories did any did you all know that no building is allowed to be built higher than 14 stories in Washington DC you go across the river to Virginia they have 21 30 story buildings but in Washington or go across the border into Bethesda Maryland same thing in Washington why cannot be higher than the Washington Monument no building in the city of Washington can be higher than the Washington Monument. So that that monument can be seen from all around the city and from the suburbs. If you're in a suburb on a high place, whether it's Virginia or Maryland, you can look across all the building tops and see the Washington Monument. Same with the temple. The temple was built on the highest point of the city that everyone could see it no matter where they lived in Jerusalem, they could see the temple. They could focus on the temple. They would know when the sacrifice was being made because they'd see the smoke going up. Even though they weren't inside the temple walls, they were outside, yet they could see. They could see the smoke rising from, from well, they couldn't see the incense smoke that was inside. But the outside smoke from the, the actual physical sacrifice, they could see. I mentioned a few weeks ago uh, about the Feast of Tabernacles and when they would have the, the night of illumination from all over the city you could see all the candelabra that were illuminated that night by the young Levites focal point the Lord must be our focal point we sacrifice everything else to focus on him we sacrifice whatever else we're looking at whatever else we're focusing on we put him first he is first and foremost in our lives but interestingly this temple was not just put in the highest spot, it was also in the historic spot. The place where Abraham sacrificed Isaac, or was going to sacrifice Isaac. Which means that we don't just run off in our own way, we have historical roots in the Old Testament. Historical roots in the Word of God to the nation of Israel. We cannot do away with Israel, disregard Israel, nor neglect the promise that he that blesses this people will be blessed and he that curses this people will be cursed as a nation, as a people, as a church, as individual believers. Because God chose that same historical spot for the temple to be built. And it was that temple that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil tore in two. God was not done with that temple. God was not ignoring that temple. That signified the entrance for all of us into the Holy of Holies because of the blood of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. The animals that were sacrificed, and there must have been tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, they were never cast off animals. 
they're always perfect and they're always a commodity. Today, we don't deal with animals other than our pets, but their economy was based on animals. It was a commodity. When I lived with the Bedouin, we had sheep and we had goats. Every morning before the men got up, the woman got up, she would milk the goats, she would take the milk and she would begin to make butter. I would awaken to hearing this thud, 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 thud as she had a goat skin suspended from a peg in one of the tent poles and she was sh gently shaking it, making the butter. We would then have tea with goat's milk in it. For breakfast a little bit later, usually about four or five hours later, we'd have breakfast, we'd have goat's cheese. I was talking about this with my kids yesterday because they were talking about how many people, um, it's very, very uh, uh, chic to have chev, to have goat's cheese. I don't ever eat goat's cheese. I ate it for three straight years. And I have lost my taste for goat cheese. I don't care how chic it is. I drank goat's milk. And then we would have a drink called Leben. Leben. Leben is goat's milk, slightly sour. It was left to become sour. It wasn't completely curdled, just slightly curdled. And you drink that. Uh, it was not really quite yogurt. I mean, how, most yogurt here tastes good. And plus, I've yet to open a yogurt here and find goat hair in it. I don't know. It's just me or, or you all find goat hair in your yogurt? I've never found goat hair in my yogurt. But when you drank the leaven, it was there. What? It just came from the goat. All right, it's organic. Who's has, who has a problem with that? It's organic. No pesticides, free range. I mean, everybody who loves, and, and I mean, anyway, we rarely ate the goats or the sheep. We rarely ate them because they were a commodity. They made the milk. From the milk, you got the leaven. From the milk, you got the lebane. Lebane is a kind of a sour cream, but much more sour than our sour cream. And you got the cheese. And the cheese, the interesting thing is, they would dry the cheese. So you could keep the cheese for a year. You could travel across the desert. And then when you wanted to eat it, you just put water and reconstituted it. It's like freeze-dried, except without the freeze, because you're in the desert. And, uh, and, and all this stuff. And then, of course, you would shear them. You'd shear the, the sheep for the wool. And you'd shear the goats for the hair. And the, the tents we would, be, <clears throat> we would be living in was made out of the goat's hair. So they're a commodity. For them to take one of their goats and sacrifice it, that's a big deal. You lose all those things that we, I just spoke about. So when we're talking about the animals that were brought in sacrifice, we're talking about commodities. We're talking about something that cost them something. Jesus was willing, no matter what the cost, to sacrifice himself. And if you think about it, he not only shed his blood for us, but he demonstrated something to us. When he sacrificed, he sacrificed himself in the natural to gain who he is in the supernatural. Before he sacrificed himself, he had to have the door opened to walk into a room. After he sacrificed himself, he could go through closed doors and walls and windows to enter a room. He went from the natural into the supernatural via sacrifice. This is the lost key to the church today. That we move from the natural into the supernatural through sacrifice, not of a lamb or a goat, or a sheep, not of a turtle dove, <coughs> through personal sacrifice. Personal sacrifice. When have you been called upon to make a sacrifice? It can be something, sometimes our jobs call upon us to make sacrifice, right? And oh man, we do that. No problem. I mean, this week, Alex say that the job called him and asked if he could come in. He normally goes in at 10.30 on Saturday, asked if he'd come in at 8 o'clock. 
He called me, he says, is it okay? I said, yeah, absolutely, we'll get you there at eight. And you know what the supervisor said to him? Thank your father. They were grateful. So when, when our job calls upon us for sacrifice, we do it, right? Can you stay late? Can you, stay, can you work a little extra hours? We need a little extra help. We're shorthanded. Can you, can you spend? You sacrifice whatever you're going to do during that time. You sacrifice it. What about the Lord? What about the church? Can you sacrifice some time on Thursday night for choir practice? We don't spend a long time. We only do, we're breaking it down. So we just do a few, no, we're not having breakdown, Dan, break dance, not breaking it down like that. We're breaking it down so we don't spend hours here practicing. We've started early enough that we can just take a little bit each week, a little bit each week. We started, what, in September, I think. So, uh, so we're, we're, but sacrifice, sacrifice, here's the key that is lost. People don't recognize the fact that sacrifice, sacrifice is a point of transition. It's a transition that many people never make because they never make the sacrifice. But if we sacrifice, it is a place where we will be in transition from natural to supernatural, from normal to holy, from self to Lord, the Lord. It may be, as I mentioned, a sacrifice of fasting. Has the Lord ever spoken to you about fasting? You don't have to think, oh man, he's going to ask me to fast for 40 days. I don't know anybody who suddenly out of nowhere starts fasting for 40 days. Maybe, well, 21 days. No. 70. No. How about 24 hours? And do it on the Jewish calendar, which makes it even easier. You fast from sunset on one day till sunset the next day, which means every single day you eat a meal, but you do go a 24-hour period fasting. In other words, after you have dinner today, you don't eat again until dinner tomorrow. And you have gone 24 hours fasting. If God ever asks you to fast, and fasting doesn't change God, but it changes us. You may need to fast from television. You may need to fast from a particular television program. You may need to fast from fast food. Anything. Giving. When was the last time you gave sacrificially? I'm talking about financial giving. When was the last time? We, we, yes, praise God, you're tithers. We put our tithe in. When was the last time that God challenged you to give sacrificially and you didn't say, get behind me, Satan. I'm a tither. Don't tempt me. No, it's God asking you to give sacrificially. Give more than you've ever given. Give above and beyond. It may be a one-time thing. It may be something in order to kick you into the supernatural of God. Pastor Jeff likes to tell how whenever he is des was desiring of a raise, he would start tithing on the raise amount by faith. And sure enough, every single time, he would get that raise. But he started by tithing on what he wanted to receive, not on what he was already receiving. How about in serving? A sacrifice of serving. Last week, I told you, Sveto said, Papa, can you take me down to the church? I want to clean the bathrooms and clean up. This week, I think it was uh, Howard and Sandy were here on Friday cleaning. If the Lord moves to serve sacrificially, this is a place to do it. This is your primary place to serve God, your church, to serve sacrificially. Operation Christmas Child. Okay, so you take 20 bucks and you go out to the dollar store, you go out to the Walmart, and you fill up a box for some of you never met, never probably will meet. And then you put $9 in it for the shipping. It may be a sacrifice for some. It may be a sacrifice for everyone to take the time, to pick things out, to wrap it, the money. But a life can be changed for eternity. You saw that young lady who's a Christian now. It's worth it. Witnessing. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have never shared your faith with another person? Sacrifice yourself and freely give what somebody else gave to you. Witness to somebody. 
And then, how many of you just love people who love you? How many of us? We just love people who love us. It's easy to love people who love us. It's not so easy to, pe to love people who don't like us. But they're the very ones we need to love, according to Jesus, who last time I checked was the head of the church. Sacrifice yourself in love. When Jesus said, turn the other cheek, that's a sacrifice. Not to be a doormat, but to change somebody's life by loving them instead of hating them, loving them. How about in honoring somebody else? We sacrifice ourselves to honor others. Don't we want to be honored? We all want the honor. But yet when we honor someone else, that's a sacrifice. When we build them up, when we speak highly of them. Basically, it's putting self last. Putting others first. I seem to remember somewhere in the Bible, something like that was said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But notice the order, you do it first. You do it to others first. That's what sacrifice is all about. You want it, you deserve it, you should have it, but you do it for somebody else. Mm -hmm.